Hi, this is Mike, and this is the first in a series of videos looking at AI being applied to solve real-world problems outside of consumer-focused software. My hope is that through understanding how people are using AI in other fields, you'll be able to take those learnings and apply them to your own work and interests, or conversely, that you'll be able to map how your expertise might help you transition to new opportunities that are more aligned with your passions and goals. In this video, we'll be looking at how AI can be used within agriculture to analyze crop yields, improve on existing agricultural practices, and extend this knowledge to new and unexplored areas such as agroforestry. Now, none of this is my content. To be clear, it's a vastly summarized and hopefully more widely understandable analysis of a webinar I attended by AI for Good. And I will link to the original presentation and research so you can check it out for yourself. This was presented by Ravana Rocher, probably mispronouncing that, the Joint Research Center for Advanced Studies, the European Commission. They did a study, and what they were trying to do is figure out if they could use AI to answer these questions in these bubbles here. So this is a field of cauliflower, and they are wondering, what will the plant look like tomorrow? What will it look like in 30 days? What is the yield in this particular region of the field versus other regions? Why does the AI algorithm perform poorly in some spots and not others? They used a UAV to take aerial photos of the crops so that they could study individual plants. And what they're looking for is this nice round head of the cauliflower. So cauliflower develops best when it takes this nice round shape. That obviously doesn't always happen. So the presumption is that by using it, they can identify healthy, good cauliflower plants and non-healthy. So here's an aerial view of what they see. And traditionally, what they would do is they'd go out and spot check different areas of the field and they'd actually like get their hands on a plant, pull it up and assess it for proper shape. And then they would draw conclusions about a general area, but you can't necessarily generalize one individual plant to a whole field of them. So what AI allows you to do is actually analyze each individual plant in a field. And you can see there's thousands of these. So pretty powerful if it works. So what we're looking at here is a time series of the growth stages of these cauliflower plants. And where the researchers want to get to is the ability to test network activation on portions of the image. So what they do is they create these occlusion sensitivity maps. So they cover up pieces of the image and they test how the model performs on classification before and after occlusion. And by doing this, they can figure out from what part of the image a given layer of the network takes information. So certain layers will activate on, say, the corners of the image. Some will activate on the center. The goal is to activate on the center because that is where the head of the cauliflower will be. That's the area of interest. So then they construct these saliency maps. These are various different methods of implementation of these saliency maps. And what they decided to do is combine an RGB and grad cam implementation versus use these other implementations. Then what they did is they took clusters of layers to see how accurate the network was performing. For example, this very first image is all blue, which means it's not really identifying the center of the cauliflower it's activating on the corners. So here, here, and here. Versus this one is very good, it's activating in the center. And this would be kind of like the ideal down here in the corner. So if you actually transpose this onto a graph, you can see this layer is the one that didn't perform well, and it's just got a ton of false positives. Versus, say, this layer has no false positives, or very few maybe. Well, the next thing they needed to do is train the network using game theory such that greater activations, contribution to prediction leads to better payout. In other words, the more accurate you are, the more likely you are to be rewarded as a layer in the network. So then they plotted this on a time series graph and you can see the x-axis here is day planted. So day one, day two, they planted these in a series, right? And this yellow line is their baseline and this blue line is the accuracy over time. And you can see on the seventh and eighth day, there was a drop. So why was there a drop? I don't know, maybe it was the weather, I'm not sure. This gray line here is a graph of when only the most useful points were added to the time series. So it's kind of the ideal line and you can see it sort of increases and then drops. 
So that's how the researchers improved their model of detecting healthy cauliflower. But how do you improve the model? Assuming we have these days like day seven and eight where the performance was bad, what do we do? If they're not useful images, we need to be able to generate them. Uh, so that's what the researchers did. They trained a model to generate these images. In order to do this, they used a GAN, which is a generative adversarial network. A GAN is structured such that there is one model that is generating images and another that is judging whether they look like a real plant. So the generator is trying to fool the judge with its generated images. They applied this GAN to a field of mixed crops. In agriculture, mixed cropping has a lot of benefits. It increases crop yield, it reduces pesticide use, it improves plant health, etc. And so they took this field where there were two bean varieties and eight wheat varieties, so a lot of diversity. And as a control, they used this plant called Arabidopsis thaliana, which they described as sort of the MNIST of crops. And if you know anything about MNIST, it was a data set. It's one of the earliest machine learning data sets, maybe the first. And they used handwriting samples from a bunch of students to write out digits, number digits, and trained a network to be able to identify what numbers were being handwritten. So here we have the reference images and the generated images. And you can see here's a reference image for an individual plant. Here's a reference image for the field. And here's a generated image for one of the plants. Here's a generated image for the field. They're slightly different. And in this black and white here, we can see what those differences are. So this little black halo is the difference between the reference and the generated laid over each other. So now in machine learning, there's this training space, which is called the latent space. And so what the researchers were trying to do is create an interpretable latent space where they could actually control what factors influence the final output image. If these were the factors, sun, temperature, rain, pesticide use, they could manipulate the, the mix of those variables in the generated image and say, okay, if we knock out the sun and we use a bunch of pesticides, what will happen? Probably you'll get a bare brown field. I don't know. So this allows you to determine what factors are most important in creating healthy crops or ideal outputs in the harvest. For example, here in this series of images, we have the real images are, are these two here. The generated images are these four and they've modified those variables for each. So in this real image, you can see they've got, I don't know, 0.6 grams, I guess that is, of fava bean biomass. And in this generated image over here on the far right, they've dropped out all of that fava bean biomass and generated an image. And you can see what the field looks like. So that's what they're doing for all of these images here is just modifying the mix of parameters. So the last thing, if we go back to our reasons to seek explanations is to discover knowledge about new or undiscovered areas. As a case study for this, they wanted to identify wilderness characteristics. And the issue is that there are no current methods of identifying wilderness in machine learning. So they picked a study region and they got all these satellite images where they were identifying anthropogenic regions and protected regions. But the problem here is that it's just like this fuzzy mix. It's not necessarily all wilderness or non-wilderness. There's a lot of features here. There's a lot of things like lakes and rivers that can cause problems. They needed a better training set to work with. And the way that they dealt with that was to take known forest regions known agricultural regions and generate these synthetic blended images where the boundaries are interpretable. So you can see one here and you can see it's kind of like cross hatch. And what they can do with this is say uh, for a specific point in the image, we know whether it's wilderness or whether it's a synthetic region. And they did this using cut mix applied to a regression network, which is called UNIT. And they named this network JungleNet. So they got like 20,000 training images almost, and they wanted to, similar to the previous studies we looked at, test the network activation. Here you have the training images, 
Here you have the activation maps. And then what they did is construct these 3D activation spaces. And the goal was to be able to construct a lookup table of where in these images the network was activated by wilderness, when it wasn't activated, and when it just did nothing. The problem with this occlusion space here is that you can only cover up parts of the image. So in that cauliflower example, we knew it was all cauliflower, but here it's a mix of things. There will always be a signal. By working in the activation space, they could set all of the activations to zero and, and essentially remove things from the image, which wasn't possible in the occlusion space. And so by doing this in the activation map, you can determine network sensitivity to wilderness. So that's what you get here. Purple non-sensitive, green sensitive, beige doesn't change regardless. So if we look at an actual image area, so this is a real image, and we look at the activation mapping, we can see lakes are non-reactive to wilderness. They're not going to do anything because they're a body of water. So that's beige. This area is sort of like a wetlands area. There's some dry land. So that is going to be prime area for wilderness. And you can see the model correctly predicts that, okay, this is a wilderness area. And then over here, this was actually artificially created forest. I'm presuming what they're saying is that these forests were grown, not through natural processes, but through human intervention. Assuming that's the right interpretation, the network could actually even predict that this wasn't naturally occurring wilderness, that it was planted by humans. So pretty impressive. That's my interpretation of this presentation. I will link to the original video and AI for Good has a bunch of them that are worth checking out. I will also link to the research paper where you can read about this in much more detail. Thanks for watching.